Welcome to your AI Injection, the podcast where we discuss state-of-the-art techniques in artificial intelligence with a focus on how these capabilities are used to transform organizations, making them more efficient, impactful, and successful. All right, on this episode, we're going to be talking about explainable AI, how to look inside the black box. Bill, you want to kick us off? Uh, we've got, uh, or just, uh, we've got a couple of folks here that are Zionics um, um, vets, uh, Bill Constantine and Karsten Tusk. So Bill, you want to give us a quick background and, um, and maybe just a few words and why you think folks are asking for explainable AI. Yeah, I don't know about you guys. It seems like, you know, in our work over the decades with machine learning or data science or whatever they wanted to call us at the time, a lot of it involved, you know, can we generate models to do things that humans could do, you know? And we figured out pretty soon with the advents of fast computers and all that, yeah, well, these neural networks and such can do a really good job in being able to predict things very, very accurately. People sort of went hog wild with that attitude. With that notion but you know in many in many circumstances with the you know people that we work with and my life yeah. you know being accurate is not is not enough um you have to be able to explain what's going on you know behind the scenes and uh, that's particularly so when you think about applications of ai for example in the medical industry like you know if you have a model that's supposed to predict when someone has cancer you know a doctor is not going to act on that just because the model is accurate he needs to know why it is that that model you know, thinks think so. So it's kind of, it went from, I think, being like, wow, these things are really cool. They can predict things very, very accurately, sometimes better than humans to be like, well, you know, we need to know kind of why the models are, are doing those, if not for, you know, kind of just trying to understand what's going on for legal reasons, right? Um, and, and, and for practical reasons yeah. of, cool. yeah, so. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll dig into that and, uh, and, and kind of, um, and kind of tease it out. So Carson, you want to um, jump in here, maybe like give us a quick background on yourself and, and what do you think of, you know, when you hear explainable AI, like what, what, what do those terms mean to you and like what kind of stuff jumps into your mind? Yeah, sure. So I'm Carsten, I do AI. Um, <laughs> that's my background. No, I'm a computer scientist and I've been working with machine learning and AI for the, the last 20 years, pretty much. Um, well, explainable AI, it's, it's kind of like what, uh, what Bill explained uh, already, right? So you're not just uh, interested in the results, but you're interested in what in your input led the model to decide a certain way. In other words, um, you know, if, if something is detected as a cat in an image, then which sections, for example, of the input image uh, make the model think that this is a cat? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I think Bill put it pretty well. We want to know in, in certain cases uh, why models make their decisions to mostly to put a judgment call on it, see whether or not it's reasonable, right? Um, and, and that the model is, doesn't detect the picture as a cat because there's a red fire hydrant in the background and all pictures uh, with cats also had red fire hydrants. That's, that's mm -hmm. kind of like the short of the story. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm just thinking about it from like a, a business vantage, you know, like, a lot of problems that that I've seen, it's like there's, you know, there's there's like kind of two parts of it. There's like a model trying to predict something, you know, whether it's it could be like, like you know predicting whether a customer is going to churn or not, or whether they're you know going to be like a loyal customer, or it could be, you know, something like how many patients are going to show up in a hospital at a particular time. But usually, like businesses that that I see, you know, they've got, they've got a thing that they want to forecast, but then they also have parts of the business that are softer, like uh, maybe marketing or sales, where there's kind of like a de facto playbook that they're, that they're running where, um, where they might be. So for example, a marketing firm might be trying to figure out how to run ads against a persona um, of, of uh, or a particular kind of class of user and leveraging machine learning for not just telling you like, who do you need to reach out to and, and now, but also like, you know, why? I mean, uh, you know, I've seen that at least with, you know, a lot of the, 
lot of the customers that we've got, um, you know, here at Zionics, that's been something that's really resonated, that kind of a thing, like digging in. I feel um, like Carson said something super important in not to, <laughs> not to dismiss what you just said, but yeah, no, please. He, he said, you know, you're talking about, say you're dealing with images and, you know, you just happen to have a fire hydrant in the background, which I, you know, maybe is more has to do with dogs uh, doing well with dog images, say, or something, but, you know, part of this exploration is too, is telling a bit more insight into your data itself, you know, and maybe if there's, you know, in this case, some biases in the data, like the bias is, well, this thing only really works when there's a fire hydrant around, which is not, you know, it's not generalized. It's not desired. <laughs> yeah, it's not desirable. I mean, you know, how, in, so you, you can imagine a scenario, for example, like, in, uh, you know, sort of the typical application of something like this is you, you have AI that's being used to be able to say whether somebody gets a loan or not, you know? Yeah. And if, and if behind the scenes, you know, say your AI model is really good at predicting when somebody's going to miss payments and that's kind of, you know, you're kind of judging it based on lots of features for these people and so forth. Your model comes up with something very accurate. You have to be able to explain that to the customer. And if the model says, hey, you know, one of the reason, the main reasons is this is an age, you know, this, this person's age, which turns out that could be actually illegal. Uh, right. You know, so from a lending standpoint, so whether it's like the red fire hydrant or, you know, some aspect like age, um, it, it's it's very important in sort of those kind of uh, aspects to understand your data more and what your data is telling you. And if it has bi biases that maybe are, are something you want to avoid in, in your model. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good point. Like, like and then the question is like, what do you what do you do about that? Let's take that scenario a little bit. Like um, I had one, uh, a similar one where you know it was in a, a predictive policing um, um, scenario where you know there were cities kind of large metro cities that were trying to figure out how to predict where to, to route police resources so mm -hmm. if you you know like let's say you're you know you haven't yet released this thing you're playing around you find out that the model's honing in on these very problematic you know kind of demographic variables like you're talking about then what the the question is like, what do you do about it? You know, like, do you know, do you strip those variables from the data set? Like, what what do you actually, th you know, like, how how do you how do you handle some scenarios like that? Well, I think I think bias is even more complicated than explainability, right? Because the model could be right, the model could because your data set is biased, and there is actually um, a majority of of let's say negative cases in a certain demographic. And you definitely don't want to use that because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's strongly biased against the demographic. But as far as the model is concerned, mathematically speaking, it's completely correct. Right. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, you can remove the variable. You can try to like take that variable and balance your data set so that, you know, all the cases you're looking at are equally distributed according to that variable. Um, it's a tough, tough cookie. Yeah, yeah. And I think my point, my point is explainable AI doesn't solve that problem, but it alerts you to the problem. Right. And yeah. and uh, and as you know, that's a your question is a tricky one, especially you know nowadays there's a lot of controversy around this issue and and what do you do about it? Um, IBM, for example, has is a company that has a product that is sort of geared towards it's called uh, AI Fair or Fair AI or something, kind of an initiative to try to provide non-biased uh, data and non-biased modeling. Yeah, well, well, we'll probably do a whole episode on just that um, at, at yeah. some point. At some point soon, you know. I mean, just to kind of like, um, you know, we'll probably have to move on in a second. But I mean, with those policing apps, one of the things that I found interesting was that they they actually kind of limited the data down just to you know a, a lat long coordinate, so you knew where the crime took place, um, the type of crime that it was, and a timestamp. And with just, that, so there were none of these other variables were present and then they just used these three and you still had, um, you know, the models performed quite well. And then if you then sort of look at the, the you know, potential biases as if the variables were there, you know, the bias is actually still there. <laughs> like you can't actually take it out. Yeah. And so yeah. it's, a, it's a problem uh, from, you know, like, and explain it like how do you communicate that to the public you know when a lot of times folks just don't trust anything going on in an algorithm but in reality it's like saying um you know i don't know so 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 there's a new technique uh bill that you've been pretty jazzed about i know you've been talking about these uh shap values and we've you know started using them on some projects uh here can you, you know maybe like 
Talk to me a little bit about like, what did you do, you know, pre-SHAP for explainability and like, mm -hmm. what did SHAP bring to the table? That's, you know, a little bit different, you know? Yeah. So the course of action is you get a bunch of training, you get a bunch of data, you divide it up into tests and, and uh, you, you divide it up into sections. You can say 70% goes to training your model. And then you have this holdout portion that you use for test. And you know, you you choose the, the model du jour, whether it's random forest or some neural network, you, you, you train up your model and, uh, and then you spit out some results. And then the customer uh, wants to ask you, by the way, I just, I, I gave you like a thousand features, you know, the age and city population, blah, blah, blah. We just want to know, like you, like you said before, Deep, you know, our marketing department would be really interested in figuring out what are the most important features out of this set that that you know the model's using and so a lot of times these models that have they'll have they'll have um, feature importance um, functions that you can just call and say you know what did you think was important uh, in making your predictions but it's working on a bulk basis number one and number two if you switch models you know if you go from say a tree-based model to a neural network or whatever you know you're going to get maybe a completely different but valid view of what features are important. So you can get total, you know, the marketer it's, is asking the same question, right? The marketer is saying what features are important. And it's even worse, Bill. Answer is, you you don't even have to switch right? models, right? You can, yeah. you, can, you can train the same randomized model. Let's say you can train three different tree models and each one will give you a different predictor importance. And sometimes yeah. you see that uh, sometimes it's great. It makes sense because it agrees with you on a human level. And sometimes mm -hmm. you're looking at it and you're like, well, that doesn't what? make any sense. <laughs> Yeah, no, totally. but it's the same model, and it's just you know three different training runs with different initialization, and you got three different predictor importances. So yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a so that I always and I think I think Car you know Carson, we had a conversation a long time ago. You called it like the black magic or something, of, you know, the, like the black art of trying to figure out what you know these models are actually thinking. So personally, I never felt super comfortable in answering that question, knowing those you know, the variabilities and vagaries that are associated with coming up with what features are important. So, okay, jumping ahead, there's this uh, package out there in the world called SHAP and it stands for Shapely Additive Prediction. And uh, we can talk about that, but basically cutting to the chase, this package um, is one step forward towards kind of shining a light on the so-called black box by by letting us know what features were important for a given model at a per decision level instead of this entire training yeah. set level. And so that speaks directly to explainability. Um, if we go back to the analogy of, you know, you're using this to say whether somebody's going to loan or not, you know, and let's say they're leveraging it in a bank and, and it comes back negative, you know, it says, yeah, I don't think you can trust this guy, you know, for giving a loan. Now you got to explain it to them and you can say, well, here's the reasons why. Well, it shows, you know, something simple, like, you know, it looks like you missed a couple payments in 2016. That kind of was a big blemish, you know, you haven't been with the bank very long. So that's kind of goes against you a little bit. Um, and maybe, you know, as a person, a real person interpreting the results, you can have a conversation with that individual now and say, you know, what about this? And it's like, well, you know, I was going through a bad time, you know, maybe there's yeah, some, yeah. Human, some human element there. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't think these SHAP values are, you know, like the end of the story, but they're the, they're the beginning of a good um, direction in the sense that we can talk about things on a per decision level instead of a gross level. You're listening to your AI injection brought to you by Zionix.com. That's X-Y-O-N-I-X.com. Check out our website for more content or if you need help injecting AI into your organization. Well, let's let's kind of dig in there. Like when we talk about like what did we what do we learn when we talk about it on a gross level as let's say as the person trying to like improve model performance, and then what do we learn um, on the specific level, maybe not the communicating the customer advantage, but like again as the person trying to improve performance of the model. Like what's the difference between those two vantages, um, and how might you know one sort of in, inform model improvement. And the third question, to what degree can you actually trust them? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, because it's very yeah, tempting and, to just download some, you know, you know, some 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 Python package and run it through and 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 get a, a great plot. The question is like, yeah, how do you how do you how do you gain some confidence in this stuff? So I, I kind of I could say I, Carson, I'd love you to jump in on this, but for me, you know, I, I've worked in in uh, scenarios where you had thousands and thousands of features, and you know, you definitely want to trim things down in a way that, again, it has to do with explaining it not just to customers but to your boss or amongst yourselves. Why is it that our model is what is it thinking in these in this sense? If you can, if you if you put aside the fact that there is this variability and you sort of trust what the what what things are saying in bulk, you can sort of say, you know, we're dealing with a situation here where it looks like ten of these ten thousand features are the things that are really moving this model. So maybe we'll save a ton of money, for example, uh, by not collecting all these other this other data. You know, why are we wasting our time? Or the flip, collecting? or the flip side, which is like. Hey, this thing that's really important. Is there any way to get more about it? You know, is there a way to maybe yeah. like run some surveys or like extend some right. questions into some existing surveys or whatever? Totally. And then, and what you just said, then you feed that back into the loop, and shoot, maybe your accuracy goes up. Like, well, so, we're going down the right path. But first, <laughs> so let's go back to that what I said earlier, where I have a decision tree and I train three different decision trees on the same data set with different initialization, and I do a feature importance and I get like completely different hierarchies of feature importance for these three trees. Um, how do you prevent that? Or what does your, is your SHEP model, are they trained on, um, or are they analyzing a given trained model? Do they train their own models? How are they produced? And um, what sort of stability is in those models, right? So because it could be that things. I'm looking at a certain you know, predictor importance, um, but it doesn't yeah. apply to my model at all. So yeah. are they more data set related or more model related? So kind of jumping ahead in the conversation, the SHAP values are sort of advertised as being able to be applied to, to any model. Um, the computational burden can be quite um, high. Um, and so some of them have uh, customized routines for tree-based models, customized routines for neural network-based models. And then they have kind of like this generalized version that you can use for literally any model you want to feed so into it. do they retrain? But, but it, Retrain but your model, or do they work with the trained model? They work with the, the trained model, but substituting uh, uh, substituting uh, baseline features for other features. So we're kind of getting into the, the the details, but the the uh, I wanted to make a comment about what you just said because uh, it's totally true. Like decision trees are known to be super fickle beasts. Like a small change in the training data will change a tree maybe completely, and therefore change what features are important to it. Um, but they try to offset that effect with things like random forest, where you grow hundreds of trees or thousands of trees, and you're taking random samples of the data, both in terms of the features that you use and how many observations you feed into that thing. And so there, you're kind of getting something that's probably a bit more, a lot more generalizable um, than a decision tree. So my first, my first, I agree with you about the decision trees, but there are maybe some solutions towards something that, like that using random forest. But the SHAP, the SHAP values are you know, like, again, one of the selling points is, is they're not beholden to one particular model. When I've actually used right, them- Right, but though, I mean, I, I just used decision what, trees as an example, right? It's not, it's not yeah, about yeah. that particular model. It's about the, um, <laughs> the instability of feature importance, no yes. matter what model you're using, right? Neural right, networks I, have the same thing, right? I, I train a neural totally, network three times yeah. and well, depending on where the gradient uh, descent went, you have a different network and you have yeah. different features that are important. So as a practical measure, what I've done um, is I have tried multiple models, not trusting just one with the SHAP values and looking for a common set of features that, that SHAP thinks are important. And, you know, so in other words, if I run something through random forest and I get one view, I run it, you know, again, you, so you're looking for variability within one model, but also across different types of models. Right, that's pretty interesting. So what kind of variability did you experience there? How, how, you know, how, I, um, I, how much did the sets of features yeah. differ from each other? You know, with, with the random forest stuff, it tended to, it, for, the, for the top, now, of course, this is all very much, <laughs> the asterisk, asterisk on this conversation is sort of all, always, this is always data driven stuff, right? I mean, you can't talk about this in a general sense. You have to talk about it in terms of, 
given the data that I was dealing with at the time, what did I experience? And I found that, you know, like the top, you get these as a stack rank list and the top like five or so were pretty consistent within a given, uh, like say random forest model. And then if we switch to something else, like maybe a, um, instead of using, like we use some sort of gradient boosted or some sort of weak learner tree-based model, I found in this particular case that, that there are quite a few, which was nice, uh, features that it said were important that were common with the random forest model and it tended to be those top features. When you get down to the sort of the minutia features that don't really seem, then I start to trust it a lot less. And, uh, and so, I mean, I guess my takeaway, Carson, was I, I, I totally agree with you that I had this sense of like, you can't really trust this stuff, but when you start seeing consistency both within a model and across models, you know, maybe there's a bit, something more to this. I didn't go, I didn't have the time to go into step into a neural network model at that point, say, um, but that would have been a great experiment um, to run, so. Yeah, I mean, at least it gives you an idea and you, you get some confidence if the same, you know, candidates show up again and again. And um, dude, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this, there's that. And then the other thing was, and Deep talked about it earlier, was quite a few of these features were very intuitive. It's like, and then when we went back to the customer with it, they were like, oh yeah, actually there was a couple of them I didn't quite understand. We went back to the customer, it's like, look, this is a kind of consistent message that we're hearing from the SHAP values. What about this? And they say, oh yeah, I can, you know, I that's can totally see that. And that's a really important point, Bill. Like a lot of times, you know, when you're interacting with somebody who really understands, you know, the, the data as context, you know, as the data scientists, we don't always know that, but sometimes, but you know, in our case, we're usually working with a customer that understands their data well, to the extent that you learn something from, you know, about your about your variables, whether it's SHAP or other techniques, when you get that validation from the customer and they come back and like, oh no, that makes a lot of sense. And here's why. And then they end up, it opens up a conversation where all of a sudden the customer is talking about, you know, well, there's, you know, there's this these other four or five variables that maybe as the data science, we didn't know what they were. They were just a bunch of cryptic values, but all of a sudden. They're like, yeah, and they start talking about their business logic or their business rules that sort of ultimately, yeah. you know, describe, give you a lot of insight into what's going on. I've just found that conversation to be super valuable because it usually helps us understand, like, you know, what other data do we need to go after and get? Yeah, I, I totally agree. It, it really, I mean, it's, it doesn't it feel like, I mean, for me, it felt like a new conversation that I couldn't have had a decade ago, you know, like, like with any confidence at all, you know, so. Um, well, so that's, that, that's something that I'm not, I'm not, uh, so there, there's a difference between like, you, you know, like a decade ago, you could still have taken a model and you could still do things like, you know, withhold a variable, run it, look at your predictions and then stack rank, let's say the variables based on their omissions impact to, you know, to efficacy. So, yes. you know, you could do stuff like that. You could do that with combinations of variables and you could have an overall picture of, um, you know, maybe not perfect, but you would, you'd be able to understand like, you know, certain variables and maybe combination of variables that were really important. Like that's where I think Shap's different and I don't, I don't fully understand it. So maybe you can kind of speak to the, the process I I to understand it or how you speculate it works, but like, Make like what when you, when you have the ability to say something at a particular, you know, customer or prediction or inference level, like what's what's going on that's different than this? Let's say this this variable emission strategy. But also we, before we move to that, this I was before I lose my track of thought. Um, the whole explainability it's it's also a philosophical question, right? You, you said mm -hmm. earlier like it needs to be intuitive, it needs to make sense, and sometimes it doesn't, right? Um, for example, a decision tree is a model you can always explain completely mm -hmm. but whether or not the decision it makes you can you can i can tell you exactly why it made that decision because i just traced down the tree um but it may or may not make sense and so there's mm -hmm. like this element where it's really important that not only can you explain why the model decides it also needs to make sense to the human observer before mm -hmm. they reject it or accept the model right um yeah i i agree with you i almost think it's like it is philosophical, but it's it's building trust in what this thing is telling you with your customers or with you know you understanding what's it's, going on under the hood. 
It's a tra- it's, it is a trust. And people think of, you know, I, I know that depending on what type of exec you are, you might think about a model's performance on a global scale, but like customer service doesn't care. They want to know about Bob. Like, you know, and most, a lot of times these models are used on a very personal level. They're, they're trained with a, a giant swath of a population, but they're usually applied down to an individual level. So knowing something about an individual decision is super important in that, in that world. Right, and you it know. goes back to what we talked about earlier, the bias, right? Let's say you yeah. have like, because the model learns what's in, the, in your data. If your data is not good, your model will not be good. And yeah. you might get lucky and you might spot it. If you look at predictor importance, you see most successful sur- uh, surgeries are those where the surgeon wears um, a red bandana. Yeah. Now, yeah. if I see that, I would certainly question that model, and I would say, "What the heck?" I would question right? the surgeon. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> what's um, the red from? But it can be much more subtle. The, the the same bias could be present as a as a gender or age bias. You can see, yep. well, it's in people over sixty years, but it's wrong. And and the reason why the model thought that is because in your particular data set that is actually true, but in reality it isn't. And so some of those biases are easier to spot, some are harder to spot. Yeah. Um, sometimes predictor I- importance can give us a clue. Sometimes it can. I think you raise a really good point. Like I felt really good about getting that feedback that, yeah, these things make sense to us, but you're right. They don't necessarily need to make sense. I almost feel like, again, you set up almost like a trust issue with those people to have a a broader conversation about, look, here's something that doesn't make sense. And, you know, why is it, maybe we need to study this a lot more to figure out why, like we, we agree on these top three things, but there's this fourth one, you know, that is, doesn't really seem to make and, sense to us intuitively. Why is that? And there, and there you start to look at the data. You start to look at maybe there's a problem with the data. Maybe there's an error in recording, et cetera. And it's even worse when, when you have the situation that Deep mentioned earlier, where you are not the subject matter um, expert. You are just the data yes. scientist. You got these like 300 features. You have no clue what some of them are. Yeah, because then you can you can analyze this, but you are not in a position to make any judgment about what you find. You I don't know if variable X yeah. makes sense or doesn't make sense. And so in this particular situation, man, that happened with me because I didn't under I, there was a name before me that I thought I might understand, but I didn't really know what it meant. And uh, and so it led to naturally to a much better conversation about what this thing actually means and actually where there might be a problem with that data. And maybe that's why. Or maybe that's why. So I, you get this feedback loop with this type of analysis deep that you're maybe alluding to earlier that maybe that you couldn't have done before because you're starting to you're starting to look at the at the uh, atoms instead of the the compound, you know. Um, and yeah, because so, it's not just about this variable is predictive yeah. at X rate or not. It's about well in these particular you know value ranges or whatever. Well, I think it's super important because right before you're talking about like on average over this yes, 50,000 yeah. blah, blah, blah. Yeah. This is what happened. Well, it, so then you asked me about the SHAP values. One of the things that it's kind of neat about this qualitatively, the SHAP values are measuring feature importance at a per decision level. We've said that over and over again, but they're always doing it relative to some reference point. And typically that would be like the average Joe in your data set. Like we ran in, in an article that we wrote we did a model models to predict whether somebody's going to survive the, the Titanic or not, um, yeah. you know, and make it. So what what the shot values give you is like, okay, we have all these people in the training debt, and say the survival rate was like whether you're going to live or die. Let's say the survival rate. I don't remember what it was, but it was like maybe you know twenty five percent. And now you're looking at a particular passenger, you know, Joe, and the shot values would say, you know given this feature, like for example, given that he got a first class ticket, that feature alone tend to migrate him from a 25% chance to like a 40% chance of That's surviving. Yeah. So it gives you a relative score to some reference in this, in this case, like by default is the average Joe. But also you can say um, things like, well, he was, a, he was a, an older guy, like he was above 65 years old which and decreases actually, his chance. That, yeah. yeah. So the additive part of Shapley additive is the fact you're basically saying, okay, from some reference point, I'm moving right or left, depending on, on what they felt the influence was. 
You're listening to your AI injection brought to you by Zionix.com. That's X Y O N I X.com. Check out our website for more content or if you need help injecting AI into your organization. You know, like when I read that, you know, that article of yours, one of the things that really struck struck me was I, I've never really, um, like it's not normally you don't get that much it, that deep of an intuition about who lives and who survives you know usually you might focus in you, you, you build your model but when you read that article it was pretty clear like you started to get a really crisp picture about okay you know if you're female and you're young and you're rich and you had a title and those yes. kinds of things on the on the titanic you lived yeah. like you know and and i think it's yeah. easy when you're when you're just hiding behind a you know a floating point value between zero and one of your prediction that yeah. you don't really get into that kind of those darker spaces as to what's going on that was one of the things that i found really really cool about this technique and this, this approach you know and i wanted the, the thing about that was is that i think you know you got to be careful because you could go about getting a result from chap and then making up a storyline that yes. aligns with that no matter what. But I will say, personally, I didn't have to work that hard to see that if you were rich and you got a first class ticket, you tended to survive. When you were, uh, you know, like things that made a lot of sense from a human perspective. Yeah. Um, you know, and so that was, to me, not having kind of used it for the first time, I was like, well, maybe, maybe there is a little bit of something going on with this stuff. So it's kind of interesting. So. Um, cool. Do we want to, yeah. Do we want to talk about like Shap, like Sh Shapley, like <laughs> just maybe, the, the maybe, man? maybe it's just a side note. Yeah. Shap, Shapley was this mathematician dude who ended Lloyd up winning. Lloyd Shapley. A, yeah. He ended up winning a Nobel prize for his work, uh, in economics. And he was involved with game theory stuff. And like his, his work was centered around, um, the idea that you have a bunch of people that contribute to a coalition and they win, like there's some sort of overall gain for that, for that work. Yeah. How do, how do you divide the spoils um, uh, fairly amongst the participants? So like, it's great to think about uh, like a basketball game, like say, you know, we three participate in a three on three tournament over in Spokane or something. And uh, you know, we, we play a bunch of games and then dude, we win, you know, we get, we take home the $10,000 prize. Now it's like, how do we divide the 10,000 bucks fairly? I mean, we could divide it by three, but you know, so one way to look at it would be like, well, how about just, let's just say whoever scored the most points. Uh -huh. And uh, that would be one way, but that's a very naive thing because we know in basketball, there's a lot to do, you know, winning with defense. So maybe you're deep, you're like the dominant man under the hoop and you're swatting stuff away all the time. And oh, yeah, that's me. Right, or maybe maybe uh, I'm putting this out there, but maybe Karsten he has this soothing effect on us. So when he's when he's in the game, we just are much more calm, and we're hitting trays like no problem, you know, and so forth. So you can imagine there's there's all of these. That totally elements. sounds like me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'm dominant so in the center with with, with no <laughs> no ACL and <laughs> and I'm just gonna put it out there that I probably forget not the lion's share of basketball, but I, but you understand the problem is that you can imagine this for any sort of coalition type of game, you know, what, what is fair and getting your, your share of the spoils. So Shapley basically to cut to the chase came up with a mathematical formulation for how this is or how one might go about um, doing this sort of exercise and do it in a way that, that's fair. And um, so, yeah, without delving to the theory or anything, but that, that was kind of his contribution. And um, it, it's very interesting because it, you know, it's also like a, you can imagine in, in a three on three situation, we need all three of us, imagine you have a whole basketball team. Obviously some players sit out certain games and so forth. So, and and when players are introduced into a game might matter. Like, you know, deep, you, if you win in yeah. first because you're the D man and so forth. So to cut to the chase, um, what goes on behind the scenes with these computations is, is a lot of these sort of mathematical experiments that are run almost like simulating these games and different different uh, times when players or different features in our case are put into the game to 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 serve things out and then for a given features um, 
uh, contribution, it's sort of averaged all, all of these sort of permutations. And, and so is that basically what's happening in the in, yeah. the, in the shat value extraction is that you, you, they're like kind of manipulating the variable presence or values uh, or, or ranges of values that are present. Yeah. And, and based on that, there's this kind of um, evolving understanding of their roles um, kind of like yeah, you in, take, in conjunction like, you with take, other variables. Like uh, if, I, let's say we are all passengers on the Titanic, we would take, and we want to figure out why Bill survived, you know, yeah. thumbs up. You know, you would take my features and then what in a, uh, what you're doing is you're taking say one of my features, like Bill is so old. Yeah. And then you're filling the rest of the features in with the sort of the normal drill baseline features. And, and then you add, so you're sort of introducing a Bill is at a certain age and then Bill got a, a ticket first class ticket and so forth. And then you rerun that experiment uh, and, and then you you change the order and then you take sort of the average of all these things. Anyway, it gets quite complicated, but yeah, that you're sort of filling in the blank with some sort of reference average Joe value. And so it's always relative to something like that. No, that's super helpful because that, that, that gives you an idea of like what aspect of Bill is resulting in this classification. Yeah, so and doing that so kind of piece by piece. Yeah. what what the person that made the chat package did was we sort of took this economic theory and translated it into the machine learning world and came up with some, you know, computational goodness to, to speed the calculations. And yeah, it, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting, pretty powerful stuff. Um, but I think when I saw some videos of him talking about the work, it's like, you know, how do we explain what's unique about Bob uh, relative to the average Joe? And that, that's something that's very powerful. So I mean, I maybe throw, you are the maybe you are the average Joe, but maybe you're yeah there's something about you unique. I want to throw this question out there for both of you guys. Like, do you like what is the role, if at all, of of explainability in Shap for unstructured problems? So you know, we've been talking a lot about Titanic, where you've got a structured data set, you've got name, date, age, date, you know, birth date, wealth status, etc. But what about in like unstructured cases where you've just got a blurb of text or you've got you know some audio or you got some imagery, like you know, what kind of a role does this sort of explainability have in that context and how do you go about maybe leveraging it? I I'll let Carson speak after me. I I I've seen it used, like he mentioned, there's certain aspects of images that tend to uh, like certain portions of like an ear or something that tend to to uh, be highlighted by shot values in terms of uh, like detection. Um, I, I've seen it used in that case just as, as examples. I don't have any experience in it personally, but I could see where, you know, you might, when you're speaking of sort of like images or something, you can see where certain portions of images tend to be the thing that's, that's causing um, something to, to trigger for a classification exercise or not. Yeah, so so by unstructured data, you mean things like audio or video or, or imagery. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't I don't think you can apply it because I don't think that the, the the game theoretical variational approaches that make sense where you compute like um, you know the, the distributions that, that Bill was talking about and then vary them slightly or replace the average Joe and, and swap certain pieces of it out. I don't think you can apply that there. And so people came up with other techniques. For example, for um, for object recognition, you have these these grad cam um, class activation mapping approaches, where they basically, based on the gradients and and the certain classes, would activate it in your um, classification model, trace back which um, which uh, features of the convolutional layers were mainly responsible and contributed strongly to that decision, um, mm -hmm. and then you get these weird heat maps that kind of like highlight. Um, you know, imagine you're detecting, hey, something is a cat. And you have a cat sitting on a um, yeah. on a desk. You see then a height, the, the, the heat map highlighting the cat. And you're like, great, that is correct. Um, so that helps. But it um, from our experience, we have we have worked with it in, in some um, surgery video context where we were like uh, trying to detect instruments or trying to detect certain certain events happening in these videos. Uh, it doesn't always make sense. It uh Sometimes it highlights the instrument that you're tracking, and sometimes it highlights something completely different in the image. Um, and that, yeah, that goes, those are that, always interesting. I remember seeing you, you you put together one of these with uh, some cancerous lesion detections. Yeah. Um, for yeah. like a, for an endoscope, and 
and in the you know for those who haven't looked inside of an endoscope that you you know you've got these like jellyfish like creatures in there and uh a lot of times yeah it like honed in on the on the clear lesion but a lot of times it's like honing in on other like random parts and you're looking at it and you're kind of scratching your head exactly you know, not, exactly not so what it is. i feel like you're diving into this unknown section of the model where there was a distribution in your data that led to the model believing that these sections were important and maybe in the context of what you have showed it in its training data they were but in the overhanging global context that we as a human know about the problem space it doesn't make sense and so you yeah. always run into those issues and i feel like those are the same issues that you run into uh, with structured data as well when sometimes the variable pops up and you're like i don't know why it chose that it makes no sense to me mm -hmm. i think it's you know it, it traces down to the domain of the data that the model has been trained on uh, mm -hmm. compared to you and your background knowledge and reasoning as a human because in the end these these models don't reason they're, they're still pattern recognizers and so all they know is what the patterns that they can derive from the data you're showing them. Yeah, yeah, I, it, it's um, this, this part of like trying to um, like map back what you're seeing to what the model's seeing and how the model's interpreting it. I mean, that, that, that's almost always the source of like really fascinating conversations. Like I remember I, I was, uh, I think it was the city of Chicago had built a system to predict, um, I I, thought, I want to say it was like illicit uh, cigarette sellers, like who, who's, who's bootlegging cigarettes. <laughs> and, uh, and they had like all this data, you know, about um, merchants, you know, and, and, the, and one of the features that was like, you know, the most predictive of who was bootlegging cigarettes was the presence of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a male's name in uh, the store title. And, and everyone was like, what, <laughs> like, what is that? Like, you know, like Ken's market or whatever. And, um, and, the, and then, the, you know, like it triggered all this kind of investigation, this digging around and eventually, you know, like it kind of makes sense, right? Like if you think about it, like if you don't have the presence of, a, of, of that, then you are talking about a 7-Eleven or you're talking, you know, which has like a corporate structure. Oh. And, like corporate, um, you know, like uh, controls in place. Whereas it turns out like that the first, you know, the, the, the first name presence, the male first name presence was indicative of a small shopkeeper. So it's like mm -hmm. a small shop. There's no 7-Eleven corporate board to worry about. You can kind of do whatever and like, you know, hey, here's some cigarettes like under the table. <laughs> and so it, it just kind of got me uh, thinking that explainability isn't always like, I mean, there's like, there's like you're sitting in in some you know you you accidentally stumbled into some like you know something outside of your department or field like you wind up in the english lit department talking about some obscure thing from the 17th century you have no idea what everyone's saying but it's perfectly well explained <laughs> but like you just yeah. you know, there's like some background knowledge um guys this has been an awesome conversation um uh, uh thanks so much i'm going to just leave it with one last question for the two of you if there's if if our listeners want to find out more you know, about explainability, like what are either some good articles, some good things to search for, like search terms or some, some, some good uh, uh, stuff to look for. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to, we wrote a couple of articles that I think are good starting points because we've yeah, got a lot of, we've got a lot of I like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So go to zionix.com, x-y-o-n-i-x.com. And uh, or in your favorite search engine, look up uh, SHAP, S-H-A-P, values and Zionics or SHAP, values and Titanic. And uh, you're going to hit a couple of our articles there. And then uh, and then there's the the maintainer of the SHAP stuff. Uh, Scott Lundberg is his name. He's now at Microsoft uh, Research, I believe, or Microsoft land somewhere. Um, you could you could look up cool. some information on him as well. And Carson, you mentioned the grad cam stuff. Is there any anything that our folks could look up to, to get closer to some of those techniques you were talking about? Yeah, Google is absolutely great. Just Google grad cam, you'll get right. lots of information. <laughs> um, and the same thing for explainability in AI, just Google explainability in AI and you can read for days. Um, or just uh, yeah. you know, be more specific, look for it uh, on archive.org if you're more interested in scientific papers. But uh, yeah, there's plenty of information out there. All right, guys. Thanks a ton. Until next time. Till next time. All right. All right. Bye. Take care. Bye. 
That is all for this episode. I'm Deep Dylan, your host, saying check back soon for your next AI injection. In the meantime, if you need help injecting AI into your business, reach out to us at Zionix.com. That's X-Y-O-N-I-X.com. Whether it's text, audio, video, or other business data, we help all kinds of organizations like yours automatically find and operationalize transformative insights.